All right, so first thing I want to talk to you guys about is we're going to, there's some terminology I apologize for my sloppy hand, right? my, my smart board's giving me, it's not so smart today. Um, critical points are important, are important points on a graph. And so the, a critical point occurs in two scenarios. It occurs when f prime of x equals zero, okay? Or when f prime of x does not exist. And so whenever Mr. Adams writes DNE, that means does not exist. Another way to write that, you'll see Mr. Adams do this sometimes. A backwards E with a slash through. All those things mean does not exist. By the end of the school year, I'll write it this way. It's, there's a lot of symbolic language that we could use that will save us a lot of time. Okay. So if I take the derivative of a function, all right, and that derivative does not equal zero because whatever the derivative is, then probably my critical point would occur at when there's a domain restriction of f prime. Okay. So is everybody good on that? Any questions on that? This probably doesn't make sense yet, but we'll keep coming back to this, keep coming back to this. Do you have this written down? Critical points exist when? When f prime equals zero or when f prime does not exist. All right? So let's move on from there. The other thing is, is the extreme value theorem. And I'm going to draw a picture of this. And then we'll write it out in kind of not formal, but semi-formal language. So if f, and you need to write this down, this is very important, if f is continuous, okay, when I put c-o-n-t, that means continuous, on the closed interval, a comma b. Now remember, when I write it like that, that means closed interval. Give you guys a second to write that down. Then F has both a maximum and minimum value. Now, for note taking purposes, I did not write out every single little word that's in your textbook. For the formal definition, which you will know, which will be on your quiz when we finish uh, section 4.3, you need to know the formal definition. Today I'm just trying to explain it to you, okay? We'll put it, we'll make a Quizlet, <clears throat> we'll make a Quizlet uh, card set for you guys when we go to take the quiz. All right. Well, that's, that's fine and dandy, Mr. Adams. You said that if F is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, then F has both a minimum and a maximum. Watch what this means. Ready? Got your thinking caps on? What this means is that if I have a function, I'm going to draw the graph. So let's say I've got some function here, right? This is my function f of x. And let's say the closed interval is from a to b. What that means is I'm only going to look at this part of f of x, just the blue line. Okay? That's all I'm looking at. Does that have a minimum and a maximum? Yeah. yeah. Let me give you another scenario, uh, an, an easier scenario. This is g of x. On the closed interval from a to b. That means I'm only going to look from here to here. Does that have a minimum and a maximum? That's all that theorem says. It's really kind of common sense. Now, the key here is, though, it has to be continuous. 
Now, what I loved is I asked the class last period, I said, what does that mean, a continuous function? And I was expecting them to say, for every x value, there is a unique y value, blah, blah, blah. I thought they were going to say that and give me the real formal definition. And, and they said, it's not discontinuous, right? Continuous means it's not discontinuous. But that's really a really good answer, right? So when we talk about the continuity of a function, it's easier to figure out when it's going to be discontinuous. It's easier to recognize when it's discontinuous. And if we can't show that it's discontinuous, then it must be continuous. But the informal thing that Mr. Adams says is you don't lift your pen. If I were to draw this blue line, I'd never have to lift my pencil off the paper. If I were to draw this blue line, I'd never have to lift my pencil off the paper. And it just makes sense because most functions are either increasing or decreasing. So you're going to start at one point and end up at another point, which will be higher or lower, which means you're going to have a minimum and a maximum. Does that make sense? All right. Good. Now, the reason we're explaining that, because there's kind of like a second portion to that. And the second portion of that, your, your textbook just calls it Theorem 2. Theorem 2 states that if... F is continuous, ah, this continuity thing comes up again, on the closed interval from A, oh wait, no, you don't need to write all that down. If F has a local min or max, Um, if it has a local min or max at an interior point and if f prime exists at c, then, and then here comes the double whammy, f prime of c equals zero. So I'll give you a second to write that down. While you're writing that down, that kind of looks like a 6. That's a 0, right? So if has a local min or max, and we just said on the last theorem, the extreme value theorem, is that there's an extreme value, right? A function decreases or increases. And if it increases or decreases a little bit, it'll either have a minimum and a maximum. And I shouldn't say either. It has both, right? And then we said that you can even have minimums and maximums in between A and B. Now, A and B don't, aren't necessarily the minimum or the maximum, so don't get confused about that. In the two scenarios that I drew, they kind of looked that way. Well, what they're saying is that you can have local or relative mins and maxes. So this is referring to what we call a local extreme. So when, when, when you hear extrema or extreme, why did I put an F? Uh, my smart board isn't very smart today. I need to re I calibrated it this morning. It's just acting goofy. Okay. And then the other one is, is referring to what we call a global, uh, global, um, somewhere in here just write global, extreme. Okay. All right. Now what this means, I'm going to come back to the graph. What this means is that you have a, for example here, this is a minimum value, right? Because it's a little bit lower than this point here and this point here. Now the maximum value of this, this is the global max, Okay, this would be the global min, 
And then this point right here would be what we call a local max. Okay? Which one's the local max? The, like, not low, not high? This one here, yeah. It's a, it's a transition. And I'll explain minimums and maximums in a second. We'll revisit minimums and maximums in a second. That's what all these formal, well, they're semi-formal because I've, I've changed the wording a little bit. But uh, that's what that means. Because my function is continuous, because the blue line is drawn and I don't lift my pencil off of the paper when I draw it, because it's bound by A and B, somewhere on that line there's a minimum value and a maximum value, a global minimum and maximum value, because functions increase or decrease, right, most of the time unless it's a horizontal function, a constant. And so if that's the case, then somewhere in between, we can also have local minimums and maximums. And we're going to define what min and max is in just a second. Okay? Does that make sense? Does somebody have a question? Yeah. Um, wouldn't, okay, so wouldn't the global mean Just between A and B is what we're talking about now. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the question that she asked was, well, hey, look, Mr. Adams, I'm not a math teacher, but uh, over here, that's much lower than everything else. And she's absolutely correct. And so when you read the formal definition, it'll talk about domains and things being trapped between A and B. And so what that means is we're on, and so she, she, she knew the right answer. She just wanted to be reaffirmed. See, so, so we're just talking about between A and B, just the blue line, not the red line. And the answer is yes. We're just focusing on the blue line. So all this stuff we've written down is focusing on a closed interval from A to B. So how do you determine the difference again for which one's local and which one's global? I'm glad you asked. So let's let's expand on this. So now that we kind of know that, let's let's redraw it and give some numbers to it. I don't know why people like numbers. I mean, I know why I like the numbers, but I think the value of the numbers makes it kind of clear. Okay. So let's let's really exaggerate this a little bit. So here's my graph. And we'll call this f of x. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bind this from a to b. Now, what that means is the red line is f of x, but all those rules that we talk about are gonna be bound on the closed interval from a to b, which is gonna be this blue line. And I'm going to move, I'm going to do it right here on purpose, a little bit to the left. So let's make my line a little bit more over here. We'll make a big, huge line. So it starts here, and it ends here. So if I were to take like a little, think of like A and B being like the fence that holds everything in, right? Okay? So that's what we're going to focus on. Let's do the globals first. Let's do the globals and, and, and first. So global, and I like your textbook. I've, I learned it as global, but your, ta your textbook said absolute. What is the lowest value, graphically speaking? Yeah, it's right here, right? And let's just attach a number to it. Let's just call this, uh, I don't know, 1 comma negative 4. So this is what we will call the global or absolute min. All right? What's the absolute maximum, the global maximum? Everybody's pointing, but I'm assuming you're pointing right up here, right? So this is the global maximum y value. And I, I should point out that this, all this stuff is referring to the y values, not the x values. Okay, now let's attach a number to that. Let's say that that's like 12 comma 32, all right? And so we're, we're focusing on the y values because when we talk about min and maxes, we're talking about the y values, okay? Now, are there any local minimums and maximums? Yeah. Let's do a different uh, color for that. Right here is what we would call a local max, and right here is what we would call a local minimum, 
And you say, well, Mr. Adams, that's the global. Yeah, that's true. Technically, it's the global one. But we only know it's the global one because we're looking at the graph. If we were to look at the, the equation, we'd have to do some work, and we'd find out that that's a local minimum first. Which one's the local minimum? Is Anyone in purple, negative. right? But we would make the determination that this one is the global maximum or minimum based on some algebra work. That I haven't taught you yet, but that's the goal is to teach you how to find that. Now, all of these, all of these, uh, let's attach a number to this too. So let's call this one, um, I don't know, negative 5 comma 10. Okay. Um, all of these are critical points. So this is a critical point. This is a critical point. And this is a critical point. Um, technically, this is kind of like a critical point, And this is a critical point. But we're going to put a star by that. And so if we go back where we start, and we say critical points occur here, right? The critical points are based on x values, okay? So we're, we're, we, well, it's an x and a y value, right? The point on the grid is the x and y, but we do all the math with the x's, and then we find out what the corresponding y is, okay? And then let's make one little side note. Consider the interval a comma b. In other words, we, we can't ignore x equals a or x equals b. We, we want to we wanna focus on those two. Some books call them critical points. Some books don't call them critical points. So Mr. Adams is showing you a graph because it's easier to kind of understand conceptually. But keep in mind that, you know, like 100 years ago, they didn't have fancy TI calculators. And so mathematicians did all this work by hand with math. Okay. So they used to draw the graphs based on the work I'm going to teach today. All right. So our goal then, just to give you an idea, you're going to get a graph like this, but you're going to get the function. And when you're given the function, you want to find these critical points. How do you figure out critical points? They occur when x equals a. They occur when x equals b. And they also occur when f prime equals 0 or when f prime doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Any questions before we move forward? So is global max and global min always the highest and lowest point in A and B, and then local max would be the next highest point, and local min is always the same as global max? Yeah, what you're saying is correct. I'm going to reword it a little different though. Well, here's the process. We're going to be given a function, all right? We're going to evaluate the function at A. We're going to evaluate the function at B. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of the function, find out when it equals 0 find out if there's any domain restrictions, and if there are, we're going to evaluate the function at all those terms. So we find a bunch of critical points, the x values for the critical point, and we plug those into the original function. Then we look at the y values, and you're like, oh, hey, this is the lowest y value out of all the critical points, therefore it must be the global minimum. Does that make sense? All right, so the process is this. The process is this. We're, I'll do it. Let me explain it, and then we'll actually do it. The process is this. f of x represents a function, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that function, and I'm going to figure out all of the critical points of that function. And so right now, so I go through that process, the process I haven't taught you yet, okay? And I'm going to go through that process and find all the critical points, or at least the x values where they occur. And then I'm going to evaluate the function at that. And so I do all my math, and I figure out these points here. OK? Now, based on the y values, what's the, lo what's the global minimum? This is the global minimum because it's the lowest y value. So it's the global min. Does 
This is the global max because it's the greatest y value. So I'm going to teach you a process, but before I can teach you the process, you really need to know what a minimum is. You really need to know what a critical point is. You really need to know those things first, because that's what we're going to do. Okay? All right. One last thing before we actually do the problem. So if I take that same graph that kind of looks like this, and we, we've set it on uh, the interval AB, which means we're only going to look at this stuff here. Okay. Let's focus on minimums and maximums, the local mins and the maxes. Right here, I know that's a local min, or a max, I'm sorry. And I know that this is a minimum, just by looking at it. But how do you know it's the local? Well, just by looking at the graph. It, well, I'll, I'll explain. Just forget about local global for a second right now. Just figure out min and max. How could I use the red line is f of x, okay? How can I use my knowledge of f prime to help me determine if something is a minimum or a maximum? Well, what does f prime represent? Slope of the tangent line. If I think of this, we said that this occurs when f prime of a is equal to 0. Or, well, in this case, it is a. So we'll, I'm going to replace that in general terms. If I say f prime of x equals 0, that's where that occurs. And then the same thing here. This is f prime equals 0. Why? Because what's the slope of the tangent line at a minimum or a maximum value? Zero. Because if I draw the slope of the tangent line, this is the tangent line, what's the slope of that? Zero. What's the slope of this? Zero. Zero. So now what I want to do is I want to see what it's doing beforehand. What's the slope to the left of this? Well, to the left of this critical point, my f prime value is positive. To the right of that, f prime is negative, right? Over here, I have a minimum, and f prime is negative, and f prime is positive. So what that means is, I'm going to look at f prime of x. And I'm going to figure out when it's zero. And I'm going to draw a grid. And so it's zero at this point, and it's zero at this point. If it's positive here and negative here, what did we call that? A maximum. If it's negative here and it changed to positive, then we said it was a minimum. Let's look at the graph. Okay. So let me write this just a little bit different. We have a maximum value if f prime goes from positive and transitions to negative. We have a minimum if f prime goes from negative and transitions to positive. What's trapped in the middle? A critical point. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? We're going to put all this stuff together on one problem in just a second. Have I, have I said anything that didn't make sense? Probably eager to figure out how this all fits together. 
And so let's try. So now what I want you guys to do is let's consider f of x is equal to 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3x minus 2. I'm going to graph that on, the, on my calculator. So I'm going to say 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3x minus 2. And so I'm going to graph that. I might have to adjust my window a little bit. Now what I'd like for you guys to do, write it down on your paper real quick and then grab your calculators and graph that if you have your calculator with you. We should start bringing our calculators every day though because we're going to use them a lot. Okay. So I'll give you some time to do that. Actually, you know what? Um, change this, not 4. Let's change that to like 7x. 7x. I can't remember what it was. I think it was 7x is what 7x I used. 7x squared. Yeah, 7x squared. Yeah, okay, that's good. And let's set our window on our calculators. Let's go from like a, a 0 to 5. Actually, no. Let, yeah, let's do like 0 to 7. And then the minimum could be like negative 5 to 5. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, good, yeah. So I think what I did in my window was for my x value, I did, um, I think I did 0 to 5. 7. 7, yeah, that's better. 0 to 7 by, what did I do, negative 5 to 5 or something like that? Okay. And so I've graphed, and just so we're kind of matching, I'll try, I'm going to change the color of this. Uh, to red because that's what I wrote it down in. Okay. So now when I graph it, it's not helping me. It's not. It's not cooperating here. There we go. All right. So, so now I have my red line. So now in green, what's f prime of this bad boy? It'd be 9x squared. 14x plus 3. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now, what were the critical points? We're going we're gonna to forget about the, the global max and mins for a second. What were the critical points? Do you guys remember? It's on your notes. When zero f of x equals 0 or f of x is not When exist. f prime when f equals 0 or f prime does not exist. exist. All right. So. Let's do this real quick. Uh, I need to figure out when this equals zero. What's the quickest way? Yeah. yeah, if we if we make this equal zero, right? If we make this equal zero and then solve, it would require the quadratic formula to take a lot of work. We make some mistakes, but the quick way is to graph it. So I'm going to graph it, and I'm going to graph it in green because that's how I wrote it on the board. And so my graph then would be 9x squared minus 14x uh, plus 3, right? Okay. Now another thing I want to show you guys is I'm going to turn off the original graph so I don't get confused. So if I go to where the equal sign is when it's blinking like that, if I hit enter, notice that it's turned off now. So now when I hit graph, it's still stored in the calculator, but it's just going to graph the derivative. Okay. So I can find the zeros of this real quick. If I hit second trace, that takes me to the calculate menu, and i got to hit the, oops, I did it too fast. If I hit option number two, that will help me find the zeros. I just have to make sure I'm a little bit to the left of my x-intercept. Okay, that's good. Hit enter, a little bit to the right, and then somewhere in the middle. Okay, so the first zero is, in other words, f prime of, what's that number, 0 0.2566, 0 0.25, 
six six. Well, that equals zero, right? So that's the first one. Now let's do that again for the second one. So I'm going to hit trace. Option number two. A little bit to the left. Oh, man. A little bit to the left of the second intercept. A little bit to the right. Somewhere in the middle. One point, let's just say 1.3. So um, f prime of 1.3 is equal to 0. And f prime of 0 0.25 six six equals zero. So those are my zeros. When x equals this thing, what do we call those? What's the fancy name we gave those? Critical points. Now look at this function. Is there ever a time? What is the domain of f prime? Are there any restrictions? Are there any fractions where x might equal zero? No. Or well, if we have x on the bottom of it, it makes the denominator equal no. Are there any radicals where we might run into an issue, like a negative square root or something like that? Should be all no. So it should be all real numbers. So there's no restrictions, okay? Now, <clears throat> these are our two critical points. Watch this. I'm going to turn on my original function. Now, where do you think the relative mins and maxes occur? They occur when x equals this number and when x equals this number. Does that make sense? On the original graph? On the original graph. Is, it, is that because when you look at the graph, the x-intercept... Both those x-intercepts, those critical points that we just defined, yeah. line up with the minimum and the maximum of the function yeah. that we just so, so, yeah, exactly, yeah. If you look right here, this intercept right here is also where the local max is. This x-intercept here is also where the local minimum is, and it's based on the x values. So that's why we call those critical points. Does that make sense now? Any questions so far? So critical points, will they always line up with the local mins and maxes? If they follow the condition. So we're going to do one in a second where you'll see where it, there's an issue. But it still makes sense. All right? So this is how it's going to be 90% of the time. Okay? Remember, there were two parts to the critical points. Actually, three parts when you think about it. We take the derivative, set it equal to 0. That's one part, right? So there's like really three cases, right, for critical points, right? This is like, this is what we did, okay? We could always talk about A and B. That's something different. We're, we're just focusing on F prime, right, because we're talking about derivatives. So what's the other condition? When F prime doesn't exist. That's a domain restriction in F prime. So now let's do example number three out of your textbook. This is something I made up, which is really kind of explaining examples one and two. I, I think I do a better job. If you, if you disagree, go home and read your textbook and see if it makes more sense the way that I explain it. Um, but for example number three, they want us to consider the function f of x is equal to x raised to the two-thirds. Hey, this is easy. I could do this all day long. f prime is just going to be two-thirds x to the negative one-third. Now, I want to remember that that is the same as the cube root of x. On the bottom of the denominator. The three cubes. Now, before we... Now, now, normally, what we would want to do, if we wanted to find the critical points of this, what would we do first? Find out when it equals zero. Okay? So let's go through the process we just did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here... I'm going to turn my uh, scribbles off, and I'm going to graph uh, x. Let me clear that out, clear that out. And while I'm graphing mine, you should be graphing yours, right? x raised to the 2 divided by 3, and then our derivative is 2 divided by 3 uh, times x 
raised to the negative 1 divided by 3. I'm going to leave that up there so you can see it on the screen. Can you guys see that okay? How I graphed it? That's the correct way to graph it. Wait, wouldn't it, um, it'd be 2 divided by parentheses 3x to the point? Not if I raise it to the negative power. I entered it in this way. This is what I entered in. But remember to get this x to the one third, make the negative positive, I got to put it on the bottom. So on the bottom I would have x to the one third, which is the same as the cube root of three or x, right? Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, but then why didn't you put it in the calculator to get rid of it? Um, it's actually easier to do it this way. This way, the way I circled in blue. So that, that's what it looks like on the screen. I, I made it a little bigger for you guys so you could see it a little better. That's it right there. Okay. So if I hit graph, what's going to happen is, oh wait, let's, uh, let's change the window to like negative 5 and 5, negative 5 and 5. So I got, now i got to wait. Sorry. It's a window. You gotta you gotta change your window. Well, um, double check. Um, do you have it entered in exactly this way? You might be missing a parentheses or something. Let me come check and see. Well, I'm helping her with her. Yeah, put the multiply sign. Okay. Which one? Okay. All right. All right. So now the red one is my function. The green one is my derivative. So let me move this out of the way so we can see our work that we've done. We said that there is a domain restriction right here because x cannot equal zero. Or maybe I didn't say it yet. Right. So we have a domain restriction, and then we want to figure out when f prime equals zero. But hey, when does f prime equal zero? Look at the graph, the green line. When does that equal zero? No, yeah. It's discontinuous. Isn't it? No, it's continuous. It just has jump continuity. When does the green line, let me change it so you can see. We're looking at f prime, right? Yeah. And we want to know when f prime equals zero. Mm -hmm. When does that green line cross the x-axis? Well, it, it never crosses the x-axis. Yeah, so you know what that means, don't you? D and e. F prime of x does not equal zero, ever. That's what that means. Well, that was part of our thing. The first part said our mins and maxes occur when f prime equals zero. But we just found that f prime never equals zero based on the graph. So what was the other option? When it does not exist. And when does it not exist? It does not exist at x equals zero. So what's our critical point? So that means that we have a critical point at x equals 0. Well, wait a minute. So that's saying, based on what I said at the beginning of class about an hour ago, is that if I find the critical point, my mins and maxes will be located there. But that's based on the original function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph that original function again. All right? And... I'm going to turn off our, our uh, derivative. I'm going to turn my original function on. Hey, when x equals 0 on this graph, is that a minimum or maximum? On our derivative, but if I hit trace and hit x equals 0, that's the global minimum. 
That's the minimum of the function. Right? So that's how you find that. So once I know what the critical point is, once I know what the critical point is, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate f of 0. Okay? So remember that f of x was originally x raised to the 2 thirds. Right? So that means I'm going to say f of 0 is equal to 0 raised to the 2 thirds, which is just 0. So my global max, it's global in this case because of the way the graph is. It's also an extreme value. It's a local, but it's the lowest local. So it's global, not max. I wrote down the wrong word. Min. Oops. The global min is 0, 0, or y equals 0. Does that make sense? Any questions on what we did or how everything's connected? Do you have to evaluate the derivative as well? Or no? no, we don't care what the derivative is. I mean, you could. I mean, we're running out of time. What I could do is I could evaluate the derivative. So how do I know it's a minimum or a maximum? Well, what I, what I need to do is to figure it out. I know that when x equals 0, right, I know that um, f prime equals 0, right? So f prime of x equals 0. At that, at that particular point. So what I want to do is I want to figure out what f prime is at a, a number less than that. Right? So I could pick any number here. Um, and so, uh, for example, if I, if I were to evaluate this at, like, say, uh, let's let x equal negative 1. Well, then f prime would be negative. It's some negative value. I don't know what it is. And then if I let x equal a number greater than 0, and I were to plug it in, um, then I would figure out that f prime, in that case, would be equal to a positive number. And you might say, well, how do you know that, Mr. Adams? Well, the slope of this is decreasing, or, or, or we have a negative slope. So that means f prime would be negative. And then the slope here is positive, so f prime will be positive. And so what we've done here is we said that we went from a negative slope to a positive slope. And based on our definitions, when f prime goes from negative to positive, that's a minimum, right? Because it comes down and it changes direction and it goes up. But um, look at that. Isn't that a cusp? It's a function to reach. It, it, were you guys thinking that? When's it going to say cusp, right? Uh, isn't that a cusp? And we and we said we said <laughs> for chisel. Um, so we said that uh, things aren't differentiable at a cusp. And now, well, I did. I said that a long time ago, right? But now we have a deeper understanding. So before you guys start complaining about how much work this was, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. It was a long time. I'm tired. Um, are there any other questions?